Um, IOSH, the Institute of Occupational Safety and Health, is the chartered body for the world's largest membership organisation for health and safety, for health and safety professionals. There's over 47,000 members in 130 countries uh, working in nearly every sector. And our vision is a safer and healthier world of work for everyone. These free weekly COVID-19 webinars, which have run since the beginning of April, focus on gathering to share knowledge, experience and expertise pertinent to occupational safety and health. COVID-19 and safe, healthy and resilient workplaces they cover many professional, practical and evidence-based aspects of managing occupational safety and health during the pandemic. Today is our 17th webinar in the series and we're really pleased to have the IOSH Future Leaders Steering Group joining us today. As an institution, we're dedicated to supporting the next generation of OSH professionals and something which plays an important part of our work 2022 strategy. Our Future Leaders Steering Group members on the panel today play a key role in ensuring IOSH delivers through networking opportunities, skills development, and providing access to technical knowledge and careers advice, supporting our members of our Future Leaders community. The eight, yes, that's eight, Enthusiastic and highly motivated members of the group who you will meet today are Chloe Hughes, an IOSH student member and health and safety graduate at Rolls-Royce. Hayley Wright, an OHSE audit and assurance lead at the Ministry of Defence and a tech IOSH member. James McPherson, a graduate IOSH member and the HSE manager for the Glass and Glazing Federation. Jason Kamal, a chartered member of IOSH and health and safety manager at Wacot Limited. Liam Kelly, lead SHEQ advisor at Actavo and a graduate IOSH member. Philip Lancashire, the safety and health environmental manager for Building Product Design Limited and a graduate IOSH member. Sunit Atwell, a tech IOSH member and a London regional health and safety manager for Unite Students. And last but by no means least, we have Robert Jukes, health, safety and environment manager for Wax Lyrical who is also a tech IOSH member. Thank you to the steering group for joining us today. If you wanna know how you can get involved with the Future Leaders community, and I encourage you to do so, um, please follow the link that's posted in the chat box, which will give you further details about the Future Leaders community. So, our first focus talk is about the future of work, including wellbeing and the challenges since COVID-19. Uh, I'd like to welcome Philip, Chloe, Jason and Robert to lead on this first panel discussion. COVID-19 has seen four key impacts in the world of work, deglobalization, digitalization, corporate consolidation and the wellness of the workforce. So we'll discuss these areas and the impacts of the role that the OSH professional has um, in navigating this change in the workplace. Um, and I'll start with Chloe and the impact of COVID-19 on the wellness of the workforce. Hi Stuart, thank you so much. Um, yeah, so from a health and wellbeing perspective, uh, we've seen a lot of change recently with the way we live. Um, a lot of people tend to be working from home a lot more um, and that brings in a couple of perhaps wellbeing um, issues. So there's definitely an increase in sedentary lifestyle, but also access to convenience and fast food, things like Just Eat. You can be sitting at home and order a Just Eat on your lunch break rather than <laughs> going to a canteen or preparing your lunch beforehand, but also social media and technology. Um, there's a lot more going on. We're constantly on computers if we're working from home um, rather than walking around shop floor perhaps. Um, so that has its own kind of uh, impact then on our mental and physical health more likely to struggle getting to sleep and potentially struggle with insomnia, poor nutrition, leading to potentially obesity as well, and an uh, inability to switch off then from, from our working life. So especially when our computers are going off frequently and, and our phones as well, and also potentially a lack of exercise. So those can contribute a lot to non-communicable diseases such as diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Also poorer mental and physical health um, potentially being out as well um, and that can lead to our workforce being disengaged, lack of productivity, um, more likely to, uh, for, to take risks at work, um, especially if they're lacking in sleep, 
um, and trying to get things done fast and also an increase in presenteeism and absenteeism later on. Um, so I think it's really important that as, as professionals, we look at um, promoting health and making sure that we're reaching out to our uh, colleagues and also our employees um, and uh, reinforcing then positive health behaviour. So making sure that we do allow our employees to take time out um, to go for a walk perhaps, encourage walking meetings if the opportunities there um, and, and try and make healthier lifestyles more accessible to our employees. And, and on a personal level, how have you navigated some of those challenges that you so eloquently described um, in delivering your role um, in your workplace? Personally, I do enjoy a walking meeting if the opportunity is there. Um, and my workplace is really willing to allow that to happen. Um, when I'm working from home, I definitely take time out to go make myself a meal as well. Um, and I'm very strict on when I finish my workday, my phone gets turned off, my laptop gets turned off. And I try to um, make sure that if I do have a room available, that's the room that I work in. And then I only work in that room. I wouldn't sit on my bed um, of an evening and type away on my laptop because it can get quite confusing for you then um, about where's work and where's home. I think that's a challenge quite a lot of us uh, face, particularly in the in the current climate. Um, Philip, I'm really interested to understand how the Future Leaders Group can support our, our members overseas. With deglobalisation, there is a call for local knowledge in local areas, and I wonder um, how the Future Leaders Group's helping our overseas members. We can do a lot to help overseas members. For IOSH, I mean, one thing we, we obviously need to address is that COVID is, in my opinion, not going away anytime soon. It has become a part of daily life and will be part of people's daily life for probably a long time now. Um, there has been a massive emphasis on health. Um, and I think what we have to do as, as professionals and also as part of IOSH is, is build on that momentum. Um, health has suddenly surpassed safety in a way. Um, and it's become a massive emphasis for everybody to focus on. Um, we have to keep going and keep making sure that we're talking to the people that are working for us. You know, if people are working from home, we need to be making sure that we keep in contact with them. As Chloe said, there are a lot of different health issues that people can develop. And one of those big things is obviously stress at work. Those that are working from home, they, you know, they may be struggling. Normally they're in the office nine to five. They're now working at home. They're on their own. It's, it's something where we have to keep contact with them. With COVID and the changes that we've got with regards to having meetings in this format, you know, electronically, it's a, it's a huge opportunity for us as a steering group and for IOSH to be able to make links with people that are not in the same country as us or people that are in different regions to us. Um, it's an opportunity for us to be able to get together in better ways, share best practice with each other, talk about how we're controlling COVID, talk about how other people are controlling COVID and look at what we can do to ensure that we're doing it in the best possible way and trying to keep the exposure of it down as much as possible. And, and do you finding that within your organisation, employees are more engaged with health and safety as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Definitely. I think there is a definite, definite increase. And the reason for that is obviously with COVID, it's, it's been, almost been forced upon everybody in a way. Um, people are really concerned about their own personal health and, and, and COVID itself. So all of a sudden there has become a, a larger increase in health and safety. Um, for me, the big thing we have to do as an industry and as, as people of our industry is build on that and continue to, to use that to keep the health and safety message going past COVID whenever it, it decides to end. Um, we have to do that by making sure that we promise what we promise and make sure we deliver on what we promise. Um, my personal experience is the minute you start almost dropping the ball and not meeting the things that you say you're going to do, that's where people sort of lose interest. So making sure we're COVID safe is a massive thing and making sure that people are aware of that and keeping up to date with what businesses are doing. But once we start to say, look, we are going to do this, we're going to do X, Y, Z, we make sure we do X, Y, Z to make sure people stay on board. And I think we have to keep that going for the future to keep people involved. So a real opportunity for, for the profession to, to shine, I think is what I'm hearing you say there. And I'm just going to move over to, to Robert and just to ask him um, about this change in kind of work and the digitalization of the workplace. What, what opportunities has the 
change in use of technology provided to the to the ops profession i think we're going to see um a lot more companies embrace remote working so one of the things that we need to do as occupational health and safety professionals is look at um how we engage a workforce so it might be informal conversations look at using like stuff um such as whatsapp uh, skype um and you know we're on zoom here today but I like to take it away from that and just have that personal touch still. Um, you're going to have a lot of companies now looking at um, the big office spaces in London, in Manchester, and they're going to be saying, do we actually really need this or do we look at encouraging more remote working? So it's embracing the new types of technology and the um, ever increasing, you know, I know we touched on it earlier about the hours in the day um, being a limit on that but I think we're seeing more of a connected world so sometimes you have to take calls outside of your normal working hours how do we embrace that to actually there's a bit of give and take to employees so how can if you're in a six o'clock meeting in the morning how can we then shorten the working day to answer that yeah and safety is a 24 7 profession um, you know you, you're not in control of when people may have a need for your services so how do you navigate that challenge I think it's about making sure you've got a um, well-informed workforce, you've got um, a limit there, so obviously you need to have give and take, um, so if you've got someone working in maybe, um, you know, maybe if you're up at say early in the morning at six o'clock to do a talk, then you shorten the working day for them or you allow flexible working around that, so you might say right, um, six o'clock in the, in the morning, early meeting, but by midday, that's your day done at one o'clock, two o'clock in the afternoon. Excellent. Thank you very much. We well, really appreciate your your input there, and um, Jason. I'm, I'm really interested in in you know we've spoken about this kind of corporate consolidation. People not using the central London, Manchester, Birmingham. Forgive me if I miss other big cities, um, and also big cities around the world. But how do we ensure that the the core principles of the OSH profession continue to be maintained whilst balancing the provision of a COVID safe workplace. Um, thank you very much, um, Swat. So um, the core principles of um, the occupational health and safety, as we know, is we want to provide um, a healthy um, uh, and safe working environment. We want to manage OSF risk. Um, we also want to prevent the incidents which could um, lead to um, which could lead to injuries and uh, or fatalities or also lead to or occupational health diseases and, and so on. So um, with, the, um, w with the COVID pandemic, it has really uh, impacted on the way we work and, and on the future of work. Um, and um, that would mean that we'll, we'll need to be more um, innovative in, um, and resourceful in how we uh, manage our um, OHS risk within our, our organization. Talking about being resourceful, um, this um, webinar is one uh, means we can get information as um, OHS professionals so that we can meet up with our responsibilities in managing risk. Um, um, most OHS professionals focus on, on, on safety, but uh, going forward, there will be a need for us to um, refocus on occupational health because um, there is a there is um, a link between public health and occupational health. As we can see, the public health disrupts everything, and also it can also affect um, um, how we are effective in our workplace, especially occupational health. So um, for us, we would would want to apply all the all the measures, risk management measures. Um, we want to identify the OHS risk, especially which risk related to um, and the COVID. So it, it will need to update our OHS um, risk register to include the um, COVID factors. And um, would also have to um, do proper um, evaluation of what controls we have in our workplace with respect to that. And then we'll also need to implement those, these measures so that we all can um, we, we all can remain safe, even for our employees who work um, at home, not necessarily in the office, since we will not be having big um, office spaces in Manchester or, or in Lagos like, or in the world. And, it, you know, um, 
if you were not part of the future leaders steering committee but you were at the beginning of your OSH journey um, where would you be directing people to get um, some help and support you know or, or or to join this community to, to 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 gather that would you have a message for people who are considering joining the future leaders group oh sure um um I think Irish, um, Irish, Irish um, has been really resourceful for a lot of OSH um, professionals. Um, for example, you look at the recent um, um, Irish competency framework that talks about technical core and behavioral. Um, one thing I appreciate from that is it, it, it talks about strategy and planning. Here, um, the OSH, the, the young, new and aspiring um, OHS professionals would want to um, have a look at that and see um, how they can how they can build their OHS career and taking taking those elements of the um, of the um, the competency framework that way it would help them grow and also it would also help them to be very um, relevant in the profession especially with getting up to date in, information on on the on the profession, and that's what Irish is all about: advocacy, collaboration, and support. And we, as the Future Leadership Steering Committee, were very happy to um, be part of that project, the Work 20, 2022 strategy. Perfect. What, sure. a, what a great advert for Irish. Can I elaborate well, on that? Um, yeah, of course. I think uh, another thing as well is the mentoring scheme. There's a really good mentoring scheme um, that IOSH actually have going at the moment. So I recommend anyone that's looking at joining the IOSH Future Leaders Programme, look at uh, joining the mentoring scheme as well. And also there's some, going to be some targeted content towards the IOSH Future Leaders. And there's a forum online as well for the IOSH Future Leaders. Perfect. Everybody is uh, very well versed on, on the key messages there. Really good input there from you, Robert. Thank you very much. Um, I'll say thank you to you four, first of all. Um, we will see you again later for an for a in-depth Q&A where I'm sure we'll hear from all of your insights. Um, but I'll move on to the second part of the discussion now. So uh, our, second, our second question or subject is the skills of the future um, and how to present these. So um, I'd like to welcome James, Sunit, Haley, and Liam. Um, so today's skills won't match the jobs of tomorrow um, and therefore the value of lifelong learning and the mechanisms to deliver these has never been so important. So as our future leaders, what, what do you think this means for, for the OSH profession? And I'll, I'll, start, with, uh, I'll start with you, Sunit, please. Yeah, so I think there's a whole discussion now around, um, and Haley can probably elaborate on this a lot better, um, around power skills. So in the past, you know, the focus used to be on technical skills and um, years of experience and what you knew. And now it's about like, how good are you um, in influencing and, um, and, you know, learning when my mentor always talks about the three hats that you wear as a health and safety professional, putting on the auditor hat and then the influencer and the advisor. And it's about learning how to switch on and off um, and how to really have those people skills to engage um, engage future leaders and engage people within the business. I'm sure Haley can elaborate. And so the, when, when I first met you at the Future Leaders Conference, we had a conversation about this kind of uh, time served and experience versus, you know, enthusiasm and ability to deploy some of these power skills. I just wonder whether um, you could kind of elaborate on some of the, the, the fears that some of our um, younger or more newer people into the OSH profession might have and, and how you've overcome them? Yeah, definitely. So that conversation totally stuck with me and it's really like helped boost my confidence in terms of taking the next step in my career. Um, but it was around the, the number of years of experience versus the level of experience. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, you know, when we're applying for jobs or looking for jobs, often they'll say like 10 years of experience and all these qualifications needed. Um, which is important, but if you can demonstrate that you've had exposure to different things, um, you know, you might have done it within a one year time span instead of that 10 years, have the confidence to just express that on your CV um, and, and get that message across to the employer. Um, I think in terms of also just touching on CV, someone asked a really good question before the chat about 
how do you actually get these skills across on your CV and how do you demonstrate that to employers? Um, how do you show that you're the kind of safety professional that doesn't want to stop work and be a facilitator? Um, and I literally asked that question to like every single person I met last year. And I was like, how do I do that? What do I do? So I don't know if there's anyone from Shirley Parsons on the line, um, an acre, but one of the things that I did was really describe it in, in my personal statement on my CV. You know, are you a facilitator with an operational mindset whose goal is to make work more safe and efficient? Um, you know, describe your achievements, show how you've been creative and what impact that can have on the business. And if you're starting out in your career, show what you want to achieve. So describe what you actually want to achieve in that role. Show them, convince the employer that you're going to make a difference. Um, and I think that really comes back to developing your personal brand. Um, you know, what are you passionate about? Um, what makes you stand out? And then figure that out and then shout about it to everyone. Um, you know, build relationships with recruiters and your peers and mentors. Um, and do that continuously. So not just when you're looking for a job, but throughout, um, you know, your space. Um, and then when opportunities do come up, people will reach out to you and see if you're a good fit for that position. Um, so yeah. Fantastic. And I think enthusiasm, passion, and the ability to network is something that I've seen the Future Leaders Group do with um, some style, I must say. So always very impressed in that. Now, Haley, this term power skills, I love it. It's a, it's a great turn of phrase. Um, might be new to some people on, on this webinar. Just help us understand what we're talking about when we mention power skills and also how they play a role in, in, in the OSH professionals toolbox. Yeah, thanks, Stuart. So power skills is really the term for soft skills. Um, but when you say soft skills, it sounds a bit easy, a bit fluffy. Um, so power skills really are those, those skills that you need to be a leader um, and just because we're future leaders doesn't mean we don't need the leadership skills today um, so we've, we've sort of talked about now how the profession isn't just having um, sort of the technical expertise but you really need that behavioral um, skills of a leader so that's things such as um, that strategic thinking how your work as an OSH professional contributes and facilitates your organization um, it's things such as being quite agile and resilient, um, particularly within uh, the situation with COVID. Um, many businesses have had to be quite um, resilient, quite adaptable. And I think the OSH professional equally has to be um, quite resilient. But that also gives an opportunity for innovation. Um, so now is probably the time where we can change things. Fantastic. And I think the, the innovation points um, re really interesting. Uh, James, I'm just going to bring you in here as one of our um, technical wizardry people who's getting the message across through your uh, rebranding safety podcast. I know you've spoken about uh, many different things on that podcast, but I'm just interested to, to hear your viewpoint on, on really how you get to the bottom of elevating your power skills to, to make an impact in the day-to-day -day delivery of of the Osh work? Yes, sure. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, I, th I think test for experience. Experience, experience, experience is the best way. Um, you know, we, we're, we're now enabled with, with social media and, and all, of the, all of the kind of things you can do. So you mentioned podcasts. You can start a podcast tomorrow and start having these conversations with anybody. You just message them, say, hey, I've got a podcast. Do you want to come on? It doesn't matter if no one listens. My podcast is for me. It's not for everyone else, selfishly. Uh, you, you, the more conversations I've had through that has helped me, in essence, be a, be a better conversationalist. And I think when we look in the workplace, we can do that exactly the same without digital stuff by just going on the shop floor, going into different diverse areas within our workshop. We can go into the engineering workshop. We can go on to the, the same manufacturing floor. We can go into the building site. We can go into the boardroom where we can and just have conversations and start to listen and learn. You know, I really like that old fashioned saying of you're given two, two ears and one mouth for a reason. You know, sit, sit and look at how people are communicating and then just learn from that and have comments with yourself. And I think you'll learn pretty quick the more you throw yourself in the deep end in a way, have conversations with people, build relationships, which I think is one of the biggest 
things that we can do as, as, as uh, safety professionals is just build relationships with people. Um, I remember my old, old boss doing a job good if everybody hates you. I think it's the other way around. You're doing our job right if everybody likes you. Yeah, and I think the, the key thing that, that I would say back is, you know, if, if people are coming and talking to you about safety, then you're doing something right. If people are hiding things and not talking to you about safety, then, then you've got a problem. Um, Liam, I'm just really interested from, from your viewpoint. Um, we spoke about the, the behaviour and competency frameworks that IOSH has put out and the, the kind of 69 things that are, that are there for us to tackle. As a future leader, do you zero in on any of those in particular or are there any that you think provide you with a challenge and, and you'd benefit from some of the um, wisdom that was in within the IOSH membership to, to help support the development of the future leaders in some of those areas? Yeah, well, look, I mean, as, as a future leader, I suppose I'm going to draw on my, on my own experiences. I mean, the bread and butter stuff is going to be the, the CPD and, and continuous development, but that's going to be for, for all of us. That's, that's not going to change. Um, I think the key the, the key to success for any future leader is, is, in my view anyway, has been able to present yourself well and, you know, touching on CVs, whether that's presentation during an interview, um, whether it's handling meetings at a higher level, whether it's face-to-face -face meetings or coaching with, with the guys on the core face, that's, that's those that really matter, I suppose. That's, that's where you want to be able to influence. Um, for, for me, in terms of skills, um, it's, it would be how you, would carry, how you carry yourself and how you get your points across is essential. So in terms of the actual framework itself, there is some, some things that I probably need to look at. Um, and with that in mind, one of the key skills for a future leader is, is critical thinking and the ability to self-assess, I suppose. That's going to be the good and the bad. Um, I'd be the first to admit that, that when I joined this future leader steering group, I was relishing more the face-to-face -face aspect of, a, of, of the, whole, um, the whole journey. Um, I'm now having to sort of develop my online presence and, and sort of try and get across points that I would normally be able to control with a bit of body language or, 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 or sort of slight gestures that, that, that I've learned through the, the train the trainer aspects of it. So for me, uh, the, the competencies are a good way to get people started. However, you know, we all still need to focus on, on the basics that make people, people sort of interact with you and that's, that's getting your point across. I mean, one thing that I've learned in a short time with, with this team and the future leaders on board is that one thing we do have in common is that we can all certainly have a chat um, we can certainly all carry ourselves well. And, you know, even if you're right or wrong, you know, the, the way I look at things is don't be afraid to be confident and approachable. Um, I look at being wrong as an opportunity to learn. And my experience is that, you know, if, if you are wrong, you're willing to admit you're willing to learn. That's, that's the things that help, help us stand out and, and help the sort of wider community stand out in a, in a fairly competitive environment, I suppose, you know. Excellent. And, and it's so exciting to hear, hear you guys say, say that. Um, I'm going to come to you each in turn now. I'm really interested in to, to understand what's the one skill that you think you'll sharpen as a result of being a member of the Future Leaders Steering Group. Um, I'll start with you, James, um, and then I'll work round through Hayley, Liam and Sonic, if that's okay. Yeah, well, Liam stole one of mine. I was going to say critical thinking, and, and he's, uh, he's nailed that. I think that's really important. But I think to back that up, I think systems thinking is, is really interesting. And, uh, and I think that's something that we can all really, really benefit with. And systems thinking, in a way, is in, in its simplest form, is realizing that all of these components within our business, each area, each person, they all have interrelationships. And those interrelationships, at one part of the process is more important than the other. So uh, say, for example, to really make it simple, when payroll's happening, HR, that cog in the machine becomes really important. And when we're trying to get a new product out, probably the design people in your business become more important. But all of these decisions we make have impacts throughout the whole business. And I think it's really important that if we have that systems thinking based mindset, where we think everything is interconnected and interrelated, we, we can start to look at the business in a much more holistic way. And I think that's really important. I think you're 100% correct with that. I think it's really important as a safety professional to know where everybody is in their cycle so that you can uh, have the maximum impact on, on uh, the work that you need to do without interrupting uh, the business in a negative way. 
Um, I'm glad you explained some systems thinking, James. I was, I was worried about having to ask a secondary question to fill in my knowledge on that, so thank you. Um, Hayley, what's the one skill that you're looking to sharpen as a member of this committee? Um, for me personally, it'd probably be sort of the communication bit, um, which I know is quite vague, but Liam touched on it then. It's about things such as um, building your personal brand online. Um, so for me, um, having conversations in person um, came quite easily, but now we're working in a more virtual space um, with people um, all across the country, all across the world, uh, much more online using forums, using these Zoom calls. Um, I think it's for me a, a really great learning opportunity about some of the new technologies and the way we sort of communicate with each other. Excellent. And, and I don't think it's vague. I think communication is one of the most critical things that we can do. So I think it's a, a great thing to look to sharpen. Liam, let, let's hear your uh, what you want to sharpen as a result of this being in the committee. I suppose I've already tried to sharpen it in the last answer. But um, yeah, look, additional to that, I suppose, um, as part of the committee, I need to now start thinking outside the box to be able to provide assistance to to other members of, of IOS who maybe just starting out or or um, sort of want to get involved in the mentoring program. That's something I'm sort of fairly passionate about in terms of trying to help the next generation. Um, and certainly for, from my input, at least into the Future Leaders Community Steering Group, will be to, to try and have a bit, more, a, a bit more of a presence on the likes of the, the notification board that we have online, or if anybody does want to approach me personally or separately for a bit of advice or a bit of coaching, then I'll give them my experiences. It might not work for everybody, um, but just for what's worked for me up until this point anyway, um, I'll certainly try and share that out. So for me, um, one thing I would like to develop further is, is my ability to help people uh, across the world, not just within my own bubble here within Northern Ireland. That's, that's my hope anyway. Excellent. And, and what a great ambition to have. And I think you will uh, you'll certainly succeed in it. And you might be inundated with people wanting to get some experience from you. And I'm sure talking to them, you'll learn some stuff as well. So Neat, let's I'll hear from you. Email address up. <laughs> <laughs> so Neat, let's hear from you and what you want oh, to sharpen. God. Thanks for leaving me till the end. Um, I was going to say critical thinking because I just went through my acre frameworks and that like totally got flagged. And then I was going to touch on communication. Um, so I'm going to go with stakeholder management. I think I have a tendency to, um, yeah, in general, I use the same approach when I'm talking to different people. And it's important to be mindful of like who your actual audience is. And I think especially with the online presence now with the future leaders, it's about, um, you know, we're not just targeting future leaders, we're trying to, to target the whole industry and professionals, you know, at, at all ends of the spectrum who have been in the industry for years and, and new people. And it's about making sure that, you know, when we're communicating and, um, and coming up with things and posting online that we're kind of targeting everyone instead of just, just focusing on a particular group. Fantastic. Now, I don't want to get shot for running over timing, so I'm going to invite everybody to come back on to, to the gallery view and we'll, we'll hit the Q&A. Um, great insight from you all. and It's so fantastic to speak to you all. and I'm super proud of you on a personal level. Um, the Future Leaders Group is really, really dear to my heart. It's something we didn't have when, when I was in your shoes um, many years ago in some cases. Um, but you know, it's, it's fantastic for you to have your voice out here today. So really pleased for you all. But the general public and different IOSH members have got some questions for us. So we'll, we'll fire those into you. Um, so Chloe, I'm gonna start with you and ask, what role are the kind of growing mental health and wellbeing related apps playing in, in either returning work, workers safely to the workplace or, or generally generating safety engagement with the workforce? Yeah, so I think apps are brilliant in general. Um, they're really easy to use. They're very um, convenient because they're right on our phones or on our laptops and iPads. Um, so they're brilliant for collecting data, especially when it comes to health and wellbeing. Um, and also for like rolling out promotional programs um, and incentives. However, there are some kind of negative sides to app use. So obviously, an anonymous data um, if someone were to disclose that potentially they they have a significant distress with regards to their mental health or their physical health it's really difficult for us to tailor something um, that's specifically for them um, and that can always be a challenge and also really 
hard for us to then give them the support that they may, re may require if we don't know who they are. Um, and also they kind of um, are brilliant for engaging with everyone, but making sure that, that we are still having those personal one-to-one -one conversations as well. And that's what we would always probably advise, when it, especially when it comes to health and wellbeing, because it can be quite emotive topics, is that making sure we do, if we do have apps in our workplace, that we do follow through with those conversations then and check in with people regularly. Yeah, fantastic. I think sometimes we can hide behind an app or, or lose safety um, out, out of a conversation. So well, that's that's really insightful for us. And I think it's interesting to, you know, the flip version of um, apps are really great because they're accessible, but you can also spend all your time on social media so they can be um, intrusive. Um, thanks, Chloe. I really appreciate you, you, you contributing there. Um, so neat. Um, somebody raised a question on whether the OSH profession can support um, inclusivity. Um, and I think IOSH's statement of uh, a healthier and safer world for work for everyone does that. But I just wonder whether you have any, uh, any insight into how the OSH profession can actually do that kind of on a day to day basis. Yeah, definitely. I think um, we can definitely use the health side of health and safety to develop well-being strategies as part of DNI programs. So as part of diversity and inclusion programs to explore well-being challenges within various groups from like ethnicity and age to gender, sexuality, um, to, to kind of come up with initiatives to be more inclusive. Um, you know, we have lots of guidance on stress management and, you know, we recognize that stress is multifactorial, that it can impact people you know, outside of work, with issues outside of work and within the workplace. Um, and, you know, with the recent Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement, you know, what have we actually done as, as safety professionals within our businesses to check in on our employees and see if they're okay? Um, I think in relation to safety, um, it's important that we're mindful um, and ensure that our provisions support ethnic diversity. So for example, in relation to RPE, um, so I'm Sikh and men in our religion um, have beards. So, you know, do we do we have suitable equipment for employees with facial hair for religious reasons? Um, you know, I'm, I'm moving forward, like also are we mindful of fatigue and, and other risks during fasting periods if people may be fasting for like religious reasons? Um, and I think also like, you know, with diversity and inclusion um, and being inclusive in general, you know, when we talk about um, disability and being inclusive in that essence, um, you know, we all write peeps and ensure that our workplaces and, and our buildings are accessible and they're constructed in line with, with relevant legislation. But what are we going, doing to go beyond those requirements? You know, why can't every new kitchen or office be totally accessible? And I think as a profession, we're still quite reactive in this space. And I think we have a real opportunity to drive and get ahead of the curve to make our workplaces and work activities more inviting and inclusive. And I, th I think it's, uh, it's it's very, it's not just topical, but I think, you know, if you look at the long term trend, I think if the safety professional has a, a big role to play in, in pushing the diversity and inclusivity agenda. And uh, I think there's many things that we can look at that um, th through our workplace. So I think great, great bit of insight from you there. Really appreciate, really appreciate that. James, Stuart, can itching. I just add to what? Sorry, yeah, this is, I'm, I'm desperate to just say one thing that went to back up kind of what Sunnit's saying. There's an amazing book out there by Matthew Syed that essentially talks about cognitive diversity and, and changing the way we look at diversity instead of just like, you know, a nice thing to do and look at the benefits that we can actually get from having different minds that are influenced by different cultures and they think in different ways. And that's just going to help us become so much more innovative. And I recommend every safety professional to read that book. It's outstanding. What's the yeah. book called? Uh, it's called Re Rebel Ideas by Matthew Syed. Perfect. Okay. Well, there's a recommendation for you, everybody. And I think it's very interesting, that diversity of thought. Um, I've got dyslexia and I'm pretty sure it helps me think in a completely different way to, to some people whose brains are... Uh, quote unquote wired correctly. Um, I'm going to move on to, to, to Philip here and, and to ask him, uh, you know, we did start this around the kind of COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, and whether you've got any advice on 
how companies can kind of mitigate the risks of COVID-19 and, and to help employees feel comfortable coming back to work. Yeah, there's lots of things that businesses can do. I think one thing we always have to mention is that it's, it's, in, it's an impossibility to try and be totally COVID free, you know, with, the, with how long it takes to, to manifest itself and things, it's always going to be almost an impossibility to control totally. But simple things like temperature checks for people coming into the business, um, implementation of social distancing across your sites, which hopefully can be achievable in key areas, following the guidance with regards to things like one meter plus. So if you can't do two meters, looking at things like screens or dividers or face masks and, and making sure we can put those things in place. One thing we're doing here is um, something we call hand sanitizing stations. So lots of hand sanitizer, masks, gloves, surface wipes and things that are all available from stations throughout the site. Um, return to work inductions so that people who are coming back to the business from, from furlough periods and things understand the changes that are going on. So people get an understanding of what's been implemented, what's changed, how things are different and how to, to behave in the workplace in a, in a safer way. Um, encouragement of people washing hands, of course. Um, and making sure that we communicate with people as much as possible. I think there has to be a bit of understanding as well, obviously with people coming back from furlough and things like that, that there are people out there that have not had to social distance, people that have been working from home and not going out, or people that have been shielding, those sorts of things. Some, for those people, sometimes social distancing is something that's fairly new, and it's, and it's giving them the opportunity to say, you know, it's going to take a couple of days to possibly get used to if you're not used to doing it, um, and supporting them through that. Um, and making sure that they're okay and as we talked about earlier the main thing is people that are working from home is we keep on top of them keep contact with them and, and make sure that they're supported with what they need working from home yeah and it's a challenge i think you, the the empathy that you need for the varying situations and level of uh either you know risk adversity for people who don't think it's a big issue and the people that are that are quite hypersensitive to it so it's a it's a fine balancing act um i'm going to i'm going to keep you on slightly longer there philip and just ask um just ask you a bit of a killer question here so what's the benefits of being an iosh future leader um well the future leader group set up to, to do exactly almost what it says on the tin it's there to help the future leaders and support the people that are coming into this industry possibly as first time or people that have not been in the industry for very long. Um, and it's to help us and to help us understand the issues that we have as, as people within the industry. Um, for me, I think we need to focus on different areas about how these future leaders are integrated more into, into IOSH at, at branch level and things like that. Um, and the things that we have as concerns and issues as, as people new into the industry are different to those that have been in the industry for a long time. Um, and it's accepting that there, there are different issues and that all those issues need to be addressed and we need to look at how we can help people address them. Thank you, Philip. That's, that's a great, great advert for the future leaders. Um, Liam, um, I think the benefits are covered there. So I'm interested in how as a future leader, do you make a real difference? Um, well, it, it, how do you make a real difference? In what ways will you make a real difference? It depends um, what, what, your, what your metric of a, of a real difference actually is. So for me, a, a real difference is, is maybe changing a, a certain behavior that allows a person to go home safely to their families and, and not consider completing an activity in that way again. Um, that being said, I think I can speak for all of us. Um, we all try and, uh, or sorry, we all try and influence our respective industries to ensure that safety is, is inclusive. Uh, and it attempts to highlight the positives uh, and the importance of keeping um, keeping safe in all aspects of, of, of life. So, you know, for, for me, uh, the, the, the metric of, of making the real difference doesn't stop with the Future Leaders program. I think what we need to do as future leaders is, is apply what we're learning in their industries and try and change it at the core face. So, so at the operational level um, and the guys on the ground, majority of companies um, have uh, have uh, have the, the the nuts and bolts at the top, so they have their safety statements, their policies, their risk assessments. But for me, it's about developing that for for the guys on the ground and making sure that a they understand what's going on, and b um they 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 understand that it's being done for the right reasons. So my hope from the future leaders um, is that I can sort of develop that skill, bring that away to my own um, industry. And hopefully, um, through some coaching and some mentoring, as I mentioned earlier on, that we can uh, we can transfer these skills to the other people in the OSH 
um, profession and more importantly for, from um, us members across the world. Hopefully, if we can change one person's thinking and somebody goes home see if that to me is the real difference and if I can develop some skills off the back of this uh, future leader steering group, then, then that will be good enough for me. It will be a year well spent in my opinion. Fantastic. And, uh, you know, echoing that message doesn't seem to just do it enough. That's uh, really well put and, and yeah, fantastic to hear from you. Um, Chloe, I'm really interested to, to kind of understand how do you think the health and safety industry needs to adapt to encourage, you know, young workers to, or people studying to get into the occupational health and safety profession? So I definitely think we need to be more vocal. Um, when I was first coming into this profession, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it was very much a spur of the moment. Saw a master's that I thought sounded amazing um, and decided to get some experience in it. Fell in love with health and safety. And I was like, why is no one talking about this? Um, <laughs> and what was worse is when I did speak to people about it, the kind of first thing they were like, oh, no one's going to like you. You're not going to have any friends. And that is not the experience that I've had whatsoever. Um, so I got on really well with most people on shop floor and my colleagues, my managers, um, everyone's so friendly. I think there's definitely a perception of what health and safety is. And that is not what the role is. It's so versatile, it's so different. Every single day has been a different experience and that is so exciting. And I really wish that somebody had told me about this career option before I waited a couple of years and went through one degree and, and didn't realise it even existed. Um, so I think probably everyone on, on this panel would say the same thing, that they love their job. They wouldn't be here if they didn't. We're really passionate um, individuals and we really care about what we're doing. And, and it is a really, really caring role um, we're constantly talking to people, we have friendships with people, banter with guys um, that we work with, and I think that is such a fun job. I didn't think I ever go to work thinking, I wish I wasn't here today. It's very much, I can't wait to see what I achieve today. And yeah, like Leah mentioned, sometimes there are like little breakthrough moments. I know the other week um, I had one person come up to me and was like, well, I'd like to report an injury. And I was like, yes we've broken through it felt like such a tiny breakthrough but for me that was a massive deal and I literally when I got home that day I had a little did a little dance and everything because I was like we finally have started to make a change in where we are now and, and that was a brilliant moment but yeah it's such an incredible opportunity for people to do this career and I wish more people knew about it and I think that's part of what we're going to do here is very much share that with others share what we do and and get more people involved fantastic and i'm i'm, I'm certain that this webinar going out will will help uh with that and also i think you know you guys do shout very loudly uh across all different forms of media as i found out when my linkedin notifications went bananas when you were promoting this so uh you know all the power to you um james I'm, I'm going slightly off piece here, so apologies for putting you on the spot, but how do we make more people fall in love with health and safety? Well, how do we make more people fall in love with health and safety? Do you know what? There's so many, there's so many kind of media outlets out there, so like podcasts, for example, that are talking about health and safety, but they're not talking about health and safety. So you've just got to go and listen to, say, like a podcast called Cautionary Tales um, by, I forgot the gentleman's name, but he's talking about kind of safety and resilience, and things like, but he doesn't even mention the phrase health and safety. I think we, we, need, to, we need to have those conversations, I think, around re resilience and the kind of wider impact on the business and, you know, how they tell those stories. They talk about like the BAFTAs, was it the BAFTAs where... Um, one film was incorrectly awarded the, the award and et cetera, et cetera. I think it was La La Land, you know, but they're talking about subjects that were way to building resilience, building safety, safety and health in the workplace is exactly the same stuff. And I think the only other thing we do is, is similar to kind of what the future leader is doing with the student membership at IOSH as well, is talk to younger people. 
you know, can we, can we get into like schools, like really early education and talk to people about risk assessments? Because kids are some of the best at doing risk assessments. Asking mum for sweets, mum says no to go and ask dad for sweets. That's a risk assessment. They're so good at it. But then as we go through life, we kind of, we enforce this perception of safety on them, um, which I don't think it's a perception that any of us fit. Um, so I think if we can kind of address that and do those two things, I think that would be massively helpful to us. Can I just add to that? Oh, no. the, um, one of the things that I'll do is um, I recommend that we look at um, stuff like TikTok, uh, YouTube, and getting out on them platforms that kids use as well. And we can't just be you know, doing LinkedIn because there's no kids on LinkedIn. They're all on the apps. So we need to get out on the apps, get a presence there, and get some campaigns going. Stand by for Robert's TikTok debut uh, <laughs> just to coming add to shortly. What, just to add to what James was saying, I think also as a profession, um, we advertise health and safety or OSH as like a technical field. So everyone's like, you have to be super technical and really detail oriented. But really, like there's so much scope for being creative. And often people who have like a creative mindset are like kind of steered away from it. Um, but I think that's something really important to emphasize to like young people trying to you know, think about their career options. If you're creative and you're passionate and you like performing or talking in front of people, this is the profession for you. Fantastic. Hayley, um, just kind of building on that. So how do we help people that may be looking to change into a health and safety career? Um, how do they thrive in that new world? I think it's important to realize that the jobs they've done before can actually help them with their health and safety role. I think the challenge that career changes sometimes have is not having the relevant health and safety experience or qualifications. But as we've talked about all throughout this uh, session, it's actually the other skills that transfer across these leadership skills and these, these power skills. Um, so really, uh, my advice would be to use them um, to your benefit and really show what it is you're bringing to the table. Um, we've, we've talked about as well having a mentor um, and just reaching out so the, the Future Leaders Network is a really good network just to talk to other people um, who have gone through the same things as you, perhaps changing careers, get their advice, get their insight um, and engage with, with us as well. Um, and I also think having something of a plan, um, perhaps eventually to get some qualifications, um, but where you want to be, why it is you want to be in health and safety as well. Um, and I think that can then really help target um, where you want to apply and, and tailor your CV for that. Yeah, and I think Sunit mentioned it, having a really strong personal statement about what you want to achieve in, in safety is a really powerful, powerful thing to do. Jason, I'm sorry to leave you to, la to last. Um, but <laughs> I, I'd just like from, from you just to, uh, you know, what are the opportunities that the current situation we all find ourselves in present, present the OSH profession um, you know, from a negative point of view or from a positive point of view, what do you think is out there that we can really latch on to to you know, bolster the reputation of the OSH profession? Okay, thank you very much. Um, your question reminds me of at the ISO 13,000, 31,000, that's about risk management. Now, the COVID-19 factor brings risk, but it also brings opportunities. And when we talk about opportunities, we talk about positive. So um, if you ask me, I think globally, we have a dearth of um, experienced and um, qualified OHS professionals. However, with the, with the, with, with, with the profound effect that COVID-19 has, it, it brings an opportunity for more organizations, for more institutions, for more governmental agencies, to require the services of OHS professionals. And that is good too, because uh, for example, in the region where I come from, we have very few OHS professionals in organizations. Maybe because, um, that's because of regulation sometimes. So this is an opportunity. It would, it would, it, it would require that more, more organizations would want um, um, HS professionals to play a very key role in driving health and safety because OH occupational health is very uh, closely related to public health. So the, the, an OH health professional will definitely drive um, the uh, principles of public health and that's what's happening here. Also, 
um, we also have the opportunity to, um, to sell the value of, um, of health and safety. And talking about the value of health and safety, we um, bring um, not just about loss prevention, but um, a good organization that has good policies, that has good, um, good um, 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 OHS strategy, it helps the business to, to, to grow. It makes it more, uh, more, more attractive to investors because it shows that um, they, they, they have that moral obligation to protect um, employees as well as visitors. So um, great opportunity that the COVID-19 has actually brought forth. And, it, and for, for new and aspiring professionals or for professionals, I see some of the questions people asking, um, how do we implement this? Well, if your employer has, hasn't, um, hasn't approved um, your, your request on your budget, this is a good time because the COVID-19 mandates us to do some things. For example, it now requires that we, have, uh, we now have to do um, um, we don't have to track um, OE, uh, operational health parameters. For example, in my workplace now, for all employees, we have to track um, temperature. We have to track. Um, um, we have to track um, saturated oxygen uh, pressure. We have to track those factors. So health monitoring becomes important, and then the organization gets to invest in 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 that. So that's an opportunity. If you, if you if you ask me to and also uh, perfect so i'm really sorry to cut you off jason i could talk to all of you all day long um unfortunately we've only got an hour and i, I need to wrap up our webinar it's been a fantastic insight from the future leader steering committee and um, more power to you um as i said earlier really really proud of you all thank you very much for your contributions um i'm sure everybody has really enjoyed uh, the webinar i hope you have let me remind you that i actually own COVID-19 resource page. Um, it's full of advice and guidance. Um, this and the links to the Future Leaders community will all be included in a post webinar email. Um, and as I've mentioned before, there's a link to the Future Com Communities page on the IASH website. It's also been posted in the chat box. Um, again, many thanks for your participation. Thank you for those that have listened. Um, in the meantime, um, there will be a recording of this that will be emailed to you all. So please pass it on. Let other people uh, uh, see this. Um, let other people share the knowledge. And um, I'd just like to ask you back next Thursday for the next webinar. Um, keep an eye on the COVID-19 webinars page and all of our other IOS channels. Um, you'll see all the further details there. From me to you, I'm really grateful for your um, participation, all of the steering committee members and for the IOSH audience out there. Um, very nice to be able to talk to you all and I hope you enjoyed the session and we'll be with you again next Thursday for another insightful webinar. Thank you very much. <laughs>